the actual hash of the function for double is gonna be compared and once detected, we're gonna jump there, then we have a call data load which is gonna read the actual uh, input parameter of it. And then we have like uh, one optimization where it's pushing like two on the stack before actually doing the actual multiplication. And then just gonna return. Uh, now we have like the same thing with the other function where here we have the optimization with pushing like three on the stack before multiplying it. So it's quite straightforward uh, once you know how to read it. Uh, now because I've heard uh, the Brazilian uh, like uh, to talk about the money and how to steal money, so let's talk a more like uh, interesting uh, case. Uh, has anyone heard of the parity bug over the summer? So, good job. And uh, so basically that bug costed like 30 million to uh, the act actual company. So it's a mistake that one of the intern did when he wrote the actual smart contract. And like I was saying, smart contract are not very big uh, by uh, definition. But the problem is if you're an actual platform, uh, which is like misleadingly like uh, believed as secure because it's based on blockchain, but if you had like a software layer on it, and if you actually use that software layer to store money, well, shit's gonna happen, you know, like uh, people are gonna try to like steal your money, you know, it's not like when you have a bug in Adobe, you have to sell that bug to someone because the bug itself does not have, does not like old value, right? But if you have a bug in some decentralized architecture which is used for like financial uh, transfer, so obviously like some people are gonna use it for their um, own benefit. So this is like a simplified view of the actual bug. So in the actual constructor of the function, uh, so the address of the actual third party library that was used uh, is outcoded. So that's what you see in red. So it's an address encoded on 160 bits. And then the interesting part is, uh, so you have a, it is very dirty way of calling a function from that library. Uh, so as you can see, it's computing the hash of the actual uh, init wallet uh, function. And then it's doing a delegate call, which is gonna call the uh, third party library. So where it's interesting, well, if you look a bit further in the code at the bottom, you're gonna see there is a function with no name, which is basically a fallback function, which is executed uh, Anytime like uh, an unknown behavior or like an uh, unknown hash is uh, called. And uh, why having a fallback function? So, well, the main reason is because, so like I was saying, basically like a, a smart contract is a software layer on top of the actual blockchain, right? But the thing is because it's on the blockchain, well, if you have a security bug, you cannot patch it. If you want to improve it or add function, you cannot patch it. So it's basically, I don't know, like the, the worst piece of uh, like security architecture you could think of because if you have modifications to provide to your code, well, you cannot just like patch it, you know, like you have to um, find of some mechanism. So here, what we see is the actual fallback function uh, being used for forward and backward compatibility. So, if you think of uh, like threat modeling for your code, while well, it makes it more difficult because it means you have to like uh, try to uh, picture uh, what you're gonna have in the future, uh, which is pretty much impossible. And if you're gonna try to make the language verifiable, what well, gives you like a big question mark because it's gonna make it very difficult. And because of that specific like uh, behavior that you cannot like really like upgrade smart contracts, well, you have to uh, to like fallback function. So I don't know, imagine if you if you had a kernel and you would not be able to patch it, so you will still be like dependent on the actual legacy kernel, and that legacy kernel would be calling a new version of the kernel. So that would be like pretty scary. And so here, if we look in that fallback function, so there is a delegate call, but uh, unlike above, basically it lets you call any function you want, because and it lets you impersonate that actual uh, smart contract. So as you can see in the actual constructor, it's computing the hash of the function. But here, in the fallback function, for like uh, compatibility reasons, 
we're just passing like MSG data, which is basically like all the parameters uh, without thinking about it. So, which is pretty crazy. So it's basically saying, okay, whatever like arguments we are passing you, just redirect it and do the call like later on to the third party library. So why does it matter? Well, it means you can actually uh, recall or like re uh, force like, uh, some functions to be reinitialized, which is exactly what happened here in the case of the init wallet. So whenever they had to fix like the actual bug, what they had to do is to define some of those functions as internal, which is like the equivalent of private if you do like uh, like pro, uh, pro, uh, object uh, oriented programming. And, and same thing is that to add like a variable called only init initialized to avoid a function to uh, be reinitialized uh, because they were not doing any probing on the parameters, no, nothing. So it's like uh, Win32K like uh, back in 2000 where all the critical functions would not be probed, like uh, all the impute parameters would not be probed and they would just like pass anything. And now if you do like uh, smart contract auditing, well, you're gonna see probably a lot of uh, such bugs, you know, where people are just assuming it's safe, that all the arguments and parameters are safe, where they don't uh, do any uh, probing on the actual parameters, um, well, which is like pretty crazy if you think about it. But since most of the people now that's actually writing smart contracts uh, have no idea of security, also it's like a very new field. Uh, online there is not much resources around it. Like the actual like hype of all the smart contract when it started like around like April when people started to talk about the ICOs and we have heard of many ICOs happening. So most of them are actually uh, garbage, but uh, still there is a lot of money being like thrown around uh, for those ICOs. And uh, even until now, like the main use case for Ethereum is related on ICOs. So here is uh, another sample of a vulnerable contract, which is what we're gonna be analyzing uh, with Porosity. So the uh, bug here actually is a race condition. So if you're not familiar with uh, race condition, it basically means while you're trying to uh, call something and if you're trying to call a function which is dependent on another piece of code and if that uh, piece of code is finishing later or before you, well, some uh, values won't be initialized on time. So here, if you look at the actual last function, the uh, withdraw balance, so every time someone is gonna try to uh, withdraw money from it, uh, it's dependent on a third party uh, uh, library because it's gonna call the uh, MSG sender call value. So here in some cases it can fail, but it can also be like a re -entrant. So in that specific function, the actual, uh, so it's gonna call the fallback function of the caller, but that function can be re -entrant. So it means you can call it like twice. And if it happens, the actual balance will never be initialized to zero, which is here the bug, which is basically what was responsible for the uh, DAO, DAO act last year. So here, the balance initialization is never set to zero if it's uh, actually like reentrant. Uh, to understand what's a reentrant vulnerability, at least from uh, our tool, we need to keep track of uh, each state of basic block. So in that case, what we do internally is if we see that basically we are dependent of a function which is not locally uh, stored in the contract, but in another contract, we just mark it uh, as potentially unsafe. And if the following basic block contain an operation which is gonna happen on the actual persistent memory, which we can recognize with the ASTOR instruction, while well, we're just gonna mark it as unsafe. So, let me show you how it works here. So here, have the actual uh, bytecode of the contract inside the function, so,
Well, cannot show the demo stuck on PowerPoint, but uh, this will have screenshots. Uh, so here, if you use like the actual tool, uh, you pass uh, the actual uh, bytecode and the definition for the smart contract, so which is the first part you can see, the actual JSON code, which is gonna contain all the uh, function names, and then the actual code, and at the end, the last line is gonna call the dash dash decompile, so we're gonna try to recover the source code of that actual smart contract, and as you can see, it works quite well. So here is going to recognize three functions inside that uh, smart contract that we have been uh, identified th uh, from the actual dispatch function. And for each of that, uh, those functions, then we're going to like attempt to decompile the code to something as uh, close as possible to what happened. So add to balance, um, as you can see, is storing the uh, buffer in the uh, persistent memory. Get balance is just going to return the actual value and the function we are talking about in the previous slides with draw balance, we're gonna be highlighting the actual risky piece of code where the actual uh, initialization of the buffer won't necessarily happen because of the re uh, property of the uh, basic block. So, like I was saying here, so in that case, the way we identify it is just because we know it's dependent on a function uh, which is part of a third party contract, then it makes, it enables us to uh, track like uh, future uh, persistent uh, memory operations. So the thing is about smart contracts, like I was saying, there is a bunch of different vulnerabilities uh, the number of class of bugs is still like very slow, but uh, a, a lot of them uh, keep like being new, like the ICO issues from uh, July, it was a new type of uh, class of bug. So, so far, like the main one that everybody knew about was the actual risk condition, the reentrant vulnerabilities that I was just showing because of the DAO hack, which was basically like a 50 million uh, hack that happened last year and then uh, called stack vulnerabilities because the actual stack has a limit of uh, 1,024 elements and no exception were generated. So that was also one of the potential problem. Uh, time dependency vulnerabilities, uh, it's pretty good found, pretty good find from uh, MS Zbendi. Uh, he's writing some pretty good blog posts around uh, Ethereum smart contracts and Ethereum security. Um, because everything is in the blockchain, a lot of those data uh, is public. So in some cases, and especially now, we see like those new smart contract based lottery. Uh, those if, uh, can, can be like potentially vulnerable uh, because if you have a rent function, which is using uh, public variables like a block number or such thing, those are information you can actually predict for the future. So if you're gonna have to play with a smart contract based casino, well, you can be like uh, Dana White from uh, UFC, you know? You can end up uh, winning and, uh, until you get uh, kicked out of the uh, casinos. And the last one, so the uh, unconditional delete call and call instruction, uh, which is what we saw with the parity vulnerability over the summer, uh, those are also quite interesting because in a lot of cases, there is no probing on parameters. So recently, because we are on the actual network of Ethereum, everything is public, you won't see any enterprise using Ethereum because of the lack of actual privacy. There is no privacy layer, everything is public. So Microsoft, uh, not Microsoft, JP Morgan did a fork called Quorum, uh, which is introducing a privacy layer and uh, recently, um, Quorum decided to integrate Porosity in the actual bundle to make sure that all the contracts that are part of the actual network are gonna be uh, um, tested. And uh, so Quorum itself is open source, so it's, it's worth looking at. And this is one of the outputs when you run it on the actual uh, network, so it's pretty straightforward. It's like uh, JavaScript code where you just like execute it on each block. Uh, so for the future, what's pretty interesting about uh, 
Ethereum dynamic application or smart contracts is basically they were the first one to introduce that concept of software layer on top of the blockchain. And because of that, that to have their own virtual machine. So for sure, in the future, we're gonna see more platforms introducing their own like software layer, like we see now with, uh, with Java and uh, all those platforms that are using their own like uh, bytecode. Uh, so for porosity, it's still like buggy, so I still need to improve a bunch of the things. Uh, regarding the actual security community of, around blockchain and smart contracts, uh, to be honest, it's not something I was really like paying attention to at the beginning of the year. I was not even sure if I would like give more attention to it after like writing the proof of concept for the tool. But the actual community itself is pretty fast growing. Uh, there is more and more like security people like spending time on it, so it's getting quite interesting. And uh, uh, some of the vulnerabilities like uh, nobody has found yet, but uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, Cloud Burst vulnerability that Kostya Korczynski was publishing in 2008, I, I believe. Uh, so he was like the first person to publicly demonstrate that from a VM he could escape and get code execution on the host. So by definition, the Ethereum VM is uh, a VM. Uh, there is no reason that in the future uh, someone will not come up with a, a such vulnerability or even a backdoor uh, like that, that nobody would be able to detect. Uh, that could cause a lot of issues uh, if that would be the, the actual uh, case. Uh, same thing, malicious bytecode, uh, why not? Or bytecode opti opti um, obfuscation. Uh, I don't see any reason for it not happening. Like I was explaining some uh, instruction like code copy uh, are also present. So they could potentially allow uh, very interesting operations. Uh, there is some tools uh, that are quite interesting, like Oyente, which can be also used uh, be used for like uh, testing on smart contracts. And recently, unfortunately, I haven't seen the results. Actually, I tried to look for them uh, this week, but didn't see them. Uh, uh, an actual contest had been announced uh, back in July. And the actual uh, contest was basically, okay, like write uh, an ICO smart contract, but the goal was to introduce a backdoor in it, but to make sure that nobody would detect it. So that, uh, well, well hidden backdoor, basically. And uh, I mean, like the actual goal itself is quite interesting. Um, like I was saying, I didn't see like the results, but I would not be surprised if some people would have some uh, interesting stuff, you know, and would be like, you know, like just uh, pushing uh, some commits and doing some pull requests on some uh, GitHub repositories, be waiting like, I don't know, like six, nine months and then uh, cashing out, you know, by like next year or so, you know. Uh, as we have seen, there is a raise of supply chain attacks. So there is no reason for it not happening with uh, actual ICOs, uh, especially since now, like everybody is rushing doing ICOs without really uh, a specific goal in mind, it's a bit, uh, it's a bit like the, the current like bullshit trend of the moment. So I'm pretty sure most of people are just like reusing like open source code. So if someone is backdooring it, um, well, a lot of ICOs will be in trouble. Uh, blockchain VMs. So Ethereum VM is the actual uh, like main uh, VM that I've seen. And apparently there is a project on the roadmap of Ethereum to potentially swap the EVM with WebAssembly, uh, which is called WASM. So what's WebAssembly? Uh, I'm not really familiar with it, so it's part of my future research because I think it's gonna become really interesting. Um, so it had been mentioned like a uh, like few months back on the roadmap, but if you look at the actual definition of it, so it's an open standard, but the interesting part, it's, it's supposed to be supported by default by JavaScript engine, like V8, Chakra, or SpiderMonkey. So its actual implementation, at least for WebAssembly, is gonna go beyond Ethereum. So it's gonna be a more uh, mainstream implementation. And what is it? Well, it's basically like a, a new set of instruction, uh, like a new type of VM, uh, if you want to look at it this way and also using a bytecode uh, format. So the actual Ethereum WebAssembly uh, definition is public. And 
There is also something which is quite interesting. You're going to be able to do your own smart contract in C. So you won't have to necessarily use JavaScript as a language for your smart contract, but you could also potentially write them in C. Um, I'm not sure what it means from a security standpoint. Uh, if it's going to like reintroduce a lot of the actual old vulnerabilities that we are used to with traditional software or not, but that's one of the main risks. And like some of the actual like goals, you know, like a metering injector. Uh, I don't know what that means, but the word injector itself sounds, uh, it's going to be like quite interesting too. Uh, and e WebAssembly backend for the uh, Solidity compiler, so that makes sense to uh, extend support. Uh, but the fact they're thinking of actually expanding to uh, new languages is quite interesting. Uh, I don't think we're going to be able to see it. Oh, I don't have internet anyway. But uh, if you go to that address, so I invite you to go there, it's quite interesting. So it's uh, an actual um, uh, like demo of what WebAssembly is. You're gonna see like, uh, so if you go to that address, you're gonna see like on the left side, you're gonna be a piece of code written in C. And then it's uh, like assembly translation, but you're gonna be able to execute it inside your browser, which is quite interesting. So you're gonna be able to compile C code on the fly and to make sure it's going to be uh, running inside your browser. Uh, well, which is pretty scary. So that's why I'm thinking like a lot of uh, new type of issues, new class of issues are going to uh, probably appear next year with WebAssembly. Uh, not only for Ethereum but also for web browsers. Because uh, we have seen especially now that a lot of the actual like bugs uh, at least for browser happening from the actual like JavaScript engine and uh, it's probably not going to stop, so we're just probably going to see like more issues. It's increasing the attack surface like significantly, so it would be like quite interesting to see uh, what would come out of it. Um, those are like some uh, resources. So the actual slides are online, so I'm going to give the link to the uh, GitHub repository after. But uh, a lot of them are like uh, quite interesting. Um, like I was saying, like the actual like concept of smart contract itself is worth spending some time on. Uh, there is the actual link to the contest I was mentioning before, where, you know, like the main goal was to design an actual backdoor for ICOs that nobody would notice. Um, I'm trying to see, uh, yeah, like the article from uh, Martin Zvendi about uh, breaking the house for the lottery is quite interesting because we see always uh, breaking the uh, random number generation of the actual uh, lottery. So that's pretty cool too. Um, yeah, and that's pretty much it. Then it's a bunch of papers like describing like uh, known issues uh, with smart contracts. Uh, so this is uh, the actual link to the uh, repository. So if you go on the repository, there is an actual like white paper that I wrote, uh, which is like a more elaborate version of those slides. And uh, then you have the slides, you have the source code, and a compiled version of it. So you can compile it on Windows, Linux, and Mac. And uh, yeah, then it's, you know, it's worth playing around, you know, especially like I was saying, you know, like uh, with all the ICOs happening, it's like the new craze, everybody's talking about it. Uh, everybody wants to be like a, a crypto millionaire. Um, I mean, it's, it's quite interesting. It's like a, a new trend that we see appearing. Um, it's something worth to keep an eye on. So if you have any questions, you can send me an email or ping me on Twitter or just ask me your questions now. Any questions? Yeah. I mean, yeah. So potentially it's possible, but uh, it's a share-free, so I don't think we're gonna see like uh, any like collision for it soon. Like the last one is like share one, which is uh, obsolete. Uh, but I think like the real problem is not really like hash collision yet, but it's not gonna happen like now, now, but the big thing everybody's talking about is like, well, whenever we're gonna have like uh, Camtum uh, computers, like uh, what's gonna happen to like those type of crypto, because everything's gonna be obsolete. Uh, 
it, it's more like the risk, I think, which is what we're gonna see appearing like very shortly. Um, we don't know if it's like in five or 10 years, but it, I think it's gonna happen like really fast. Uh, so same thing like the quantum computer stuff, I was not really looking at it. I only started to look at it because of the blockchain thing and I started to see that people were complaining about it. And now if you look like uh, the actual like CEO of uh, Microsoft announced that they're gonna publish an SDK for like a, a quantum uh, computer, like a quantum computer programming. Uh, so it does not look as distant as what we thought before. Uh, it looks actually like really close. So that's what I would be more concerned about. Any more questions? Well, obrigado. <laughs>